Hi folks, thanks to be here for this talk about migrating from imperative to reactive. I am Nicola Frankel, I'm a developer, I'm a developer advocate as well, and more importantly, I'm not a reactive guru, meaning that what I will show you here is uh, readily applicable. It won't go into uh, the deepest foundation, it will be very uh, applicable. I work for a company called Hazelcast. We have two products. The first one is an in-memory data grid and the other one is an in-memory string processing engine. But I won't talk about any of them here. So what are the foundations of Reactive? Well, depending on your point of view, it might be uh, very old or quite recent. So like seven years ago, uh, some people wrote the Reactive Manifesto. And in the Reactive Manifesto, they described four properties of a system uh, to be qualified as reactive. The first one, it must be responsive, meaning that, well, you shouldn't uh, wait too much and more importantly, you will get a response if you make a request to a reactive system. The second is it must be resilient, meaning if something fails, it's still able to deliver responses. They might not be the right one, but they will respond anyway. The third one, it must be elastic, meaning that um, if the load increases, well, it, it must, you, you can scale it. It might not be linear scaling, but um, you, you, be, you will be able to scale anyway. And the fourth is, it's based on messages and more importantly on asynchronous messages. And it's, it, it gets its inspiration from the actor model from the uh, Erlang platform, the OTP platform. And in the actor model, basically you've got like self-contained uh, actors and they encapsulate their states and they don't share state at all. Meaning that if they want to like give data to some other actor, they send a message with the data. And so the data is not shared, it's replicated and they have their own life cycle. And then actors, they've got a queue of messages which they can handle in turn. So like, kind of like a, a mailbox. And that was the, the design they had in mind. And actually, the current model of Reactive on the GVM is a bit different. Um, most of the Reactive frameworks that we see on the GVM is, are based on Reactive streams. So they still have all properties that we mentioned, but they don't implement necessarily the actor model. They implement this kind of architecture. So you have here, you have a, 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 a queue. So that you still have a queue of events. When you get a request, you queue the request in the queue, and then you have a single threaded, that is very important, single threaded event loop, and it dispatches the messages to the event handlers. And the idea is, well, because it's single threaded, you cannot do blocking calls here. I will get back to it later, but that is very, very important. So there are good reasons to go reactive and not so good reasons. So let me mention that uh, you hear a lot about, hey, it must be web scale. Without any kind of reactive property of a system, you can easily scale to, let's say, thousands of requests per second. And most of the system I've seen, like for real companies, not Facebook, not for not Google, but like everyday companies, they don't have such a high load. So if your idea is, hey, we must scale to like 10,000 or 100,000 at the beginning of a project, probably you are doing something wrong. Now, there might be a good reason to go reactive is if you are using the cloud. If you deploy to the cloud, then it makes sense. Why that? Because when you run on-premise, you don't care that much about the, the utilization of your uh, memory. You have bought your infrastructure, you have bought your capacity, and now you can waste it. You can waste CPU cycles, you can waste memory. That's not an issue. Now, if you go to the cloud, then you will be built upon your consumption. And so you must optimize as much as possible. And in that case, it might be a good idea to go reactive because then you will use the CPU as much as possible. Of course, there is no such thing as a free launch and reactive has some downsides. The first one is it's a more complex mental model. I mean, 
in general, we have been used to like, we make a request and immediately we make a response and we can put breakpoints and everything is fine. Now with Reactive, we are making a request and we are subscribing to the response that might happen at some point in time. And with one request, it's okay if you have multiple chaining of this model, then it will be much harder to reason about. And because it's much harder to reason about, it's much harder to debug as well. Also, you have a new API to learn. You cannot use your usual constructs. You cannot use the normal if else. You cannot use the loops. You, you must model the world that uh, you are like designing in different um, constructs. And those constructs you, 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 you have to learn. And finally, the idea of reactive is you have like a whole call chain and all calls inside the chain, they must be reactive. If one of them is blocking, then the chain is not reactive anymore. You've, you, you have blocked your chain again. The Reactive Streams API act is actually like quite easy to grasp. It's based on four interfaces. The first one is the publisher. The sub-publisher will like publish it and it will subscribe to a subscriber. The subscriber is in general the most famous of all. I probably assume that you know about the on next, uh, which delivers one element on error, which um, is called when there is an exception or incomplete, when the um, the stream finishes uh, successfully, then there is this unsubscribe, which passes a subscription. Subscription itself, you can see it has two methods and here you can see back pressure. So the subscriber will request, will be able to request like the number of item it wants. So the idea is that if you have a, a fast producing publisher and a slow consuming subscriber, it, it won't be overflown. And of course you can cancel it. And because I mentioned a chain, that means that in the chain, uh, items will be both publishers and subscriber. And for that, you have the processor that is both. And that is just the basis of it. But if you just want to start reactive and you've got all those interfaces, it will be very hard. You will need to rewrite the framework yourself. Uh, for this reason, there are uh, like frameworks that have popped up and one among them, and I need to go into the detail of one of them. And because I'm a bit familiar with Spring, I will uh, use Project Reactor. Project Reactor is one such implementation. As, as you can see, uh, here we have the org reactive stream publisher and like Project Reactor provides two implementation like Mono, which has either one or uh, zero elements and Flux, we can have an infinite number of elements. Project Reactor is not dependent of Spring. It's the other way around, like, um, you might have heard also about GDK9 flow and GDK9 flow class as all those four interfaces as well. And if you go to the uh, uh, Reactive Streams uh, website, you will see, hey, folks, there will be a period in which we will use our own package and we will migrate at some point in time. Uh, guess what? Uh, it's four years ago and they didn't migrate. Probably they will never. Uh, just to mention that if you need to go from the project reactor package to the flow one or vice versa, then you have uh, the flow adapters uh, class that allows you to bridge between those two packages. Spring Framework Web supports reactive type since version 5. And actually, there is a dedicated uh, project for that with an dedicated package. So the idea is how do they differ? And the problem is that um, they don't differ that much. Like Spring MVC, you can and probably you have uh, configured it with annotations in the past. And Spring Webflux, you can also configure it with annotations. And Spring Webflux has like an API configuration, but there is something called Spring Web FN that also has an API. So at a casual glance, it's very hard to understand whether um, a, a, a project is based on Spring MVC or Spring Webflux. And in general, you start from here. And I believe that if you go directly to here, it will be very hard because you will be familiar with the annotations, 
but the underlying engine will be completely different. So in the demo, I probably, I probably, <laughs> I will uh, show you a different boss. We will first go from annotation to a functional API, and then we will migrate from functional API to uh, Spring Web Flux. And because of this, the, it will be much different. And I believe um, it won't lead you to think, hey, I know it because yeah, what happens under the cover will be quite different. I've talked a lot. Uh, now it's time uh, to have some demo. So here I've created a project. I've used start.spring.io, so it looks very neat. And the project is quite simple. I have um, a Spring Boot Starter Data GPA to access the data. I have a Spring Boot Starter Web to have my web layer. So at the beginning, I have a simple web MVC project. Uh, I'm using uh, Hibernate. And because I'm using Hibernate, I'm using second level cache. And because I'm using second level cache, I need to choose an implementation. For that, I choose Hazelcast. And finally, I have the database, which is not a super great idea to have an in-memory database and on top of that to have an in-memory cache. But it's much simpler for the demo purpose here. Normally, you would have MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, whatever. So this is a simple project. Uh, I have defined uh, my database entity. It's a person. It has four fields. It has an ID, first name, last name, birth date. Then I have my controller. My controller has two endpoints. The first one is to get a person by its ID or to get the list of all persons. It relies on a repository because it's a Spring Data GPA repository. I don't need to define anything because I'm using very simple uh, request, get by ID, get all. So I, I have got the implementation uh, provided uh, to me by Spring at runtime. And uh, the application also has is nothing mind blowing. I've provided a data.sql file. So at the beginning of the application at the startup, I've got already those values, so we can query it directly. And here I have defined some configuration. And of course, I've defined the cache to use the second level cache. And also I've generated the statistic, the Hibernate statistic to show that I'm using the cache. And uh, finally, just by providing a hazelcast.xml, like close to empty one, I already have hazelcast that it that is bootstrapped by Spring directly. So how does it work? I let's start the application. Uh, it will run the program, and with a bit of luck, it might be fast enough. So yes, Hibernate statistics. You can see them here. So here they are empty now. Now I will start my curl. I will curl local host 8080 slash person slash one, and it gets me the ID one. Amazing. We can see that uh, the cache is in place. So there was one cache miss because the cache was empty. There is one cache put. And now if we redo it again, the cache works. There is one hit. We don't hit the database at all. No connection, no statement. Everything is fine. And of course, you can like get all entities. And now we can query by a single entity, the two that we didn't query by ID before. And we can see that uh, now there is one hit because the cache is completely hot. So that's the gist of it. And the idea is to migrate this application to a full reactive one, step by step. As I mentioned, um, we will be doing it step by step. And the first step is to migrate uh, to functional APIs. So let's do that. And we will migrate to Web MVC FM. Now we change our controller. And our controller now becomes roots. Ah, it's already here. So I've changed the name because it's not a controller anymore. You see, it has lost its controller annotation. Now it's a regular configuration. So yeah, we still have annotations, but it's a regular uh, annotation configuration. And here we don't have get mapping or post mapping or whatever. We have just beans. And what we do with those beans is they are just rata functions. So instead of annotating uh, some methods as being specific, we create the route explicitly, and then we put them in the context. And it's up to um, Spring Web MVC to uh, like use them correctly. 
And you can see here, I've defined, I'm using this rot function with the get uh, HTTP uh, verb. And I will say, hey, I will, under this person, I will pass a function. And here, that's the reason why it's called functional API. It's because I'm defining the function. So the input is the request and the output is the response. And again, here I explicitly say, hey, I return a 200 with the body of what I got from the repository. And here the same with ID. You can see here that there is an, no annotation for ID. I explicitly need to get it from the request and I need to explicitly map it to a long because by default it's a string. So at this point, I did change nothing at all. I just moved from the controller paradigm to the routing paradigm. The next step is actually to move this function into a dedicated class. Um, I was not the one to propose that. It seemed that the Spring team proposes this approach. So you have your routers that are like one-liners, sorry, your routes that are one-liners. And on the opposite side, you've got, I, I've created this handler class and I inject the repository like I expected. And then those functions, I materialize them. So now they have a name, get all, get one. In that case, that's not a uh, very high uh, refactoring. We, when you've got uh, like more involved logic, probably naming them is a good idea. And now you can see that we've got one bean per route, might not make so much sense. So the idea is more like, hey, Let's factor them. And the idea is to like uh, regroup them by modules. So probably your application will be much bigger than this simple one. And you might have like a router function for a dedicated module and another router function for a dedicated module. So let's group them separately. You see the API is quite different now. You, we, you've got this pass function and you pass it a, a builder. And the builder will actually uh, like regroup the get the mapping and the handler. And let's check that it works because at this point we've done already a bit of uh, refactoring and we must check that everything is as expected. So it started as uh, previously. Uh, we will just check that the curl2 works. So yes, it works. Caching is still in place. We still have one miss. We still have one put. And if we redo it, then we have one hit. So it's pretty good, uh, I must say. Um, again, nothing reactive yet, only like just we change the way we are writing the application. The next step is where the magic happens because now we are migrating from like Spring Web MVC to Spring Web Flux. And now it's very interesting because the difference is quite small. So from the POM, I change the Spring Boot Starter Web to Spring Boot Starter Web Flux. And on the routing side, I just changed the package name. So I, I move from the like Web MVC package to the Spring Web Flux package, but the names of the interfaces, they are the same. So actually, I just need to change the written type because now I have like uh, reactive types. I have mono of server response. I don't have the server response, but you can see the names, the server requests doesn't change. The okay doesn't change. There is a slight change. Uh, we must move from body because in the non-reactive world, uh, we just write into uh, the body of the request here. We return something that is blocking and here we are in the non-blocking world. So instead of having just body, we have body value. And when we move to a fully reactive uh, call chain, then we will get back to our body. But that is as simple as that. That's the reason why I wanted to, to get to all those steps before. It's because um, if I just move directly from meditation to this place, it might be a bit harder to grasp. Now we have reactive types, we have like functional API, and we can still check that it works and we should. So now the application has started. We can like check again that it works. 
and we still have our cache miss put it still works here again hit yes but um, if you paid attention uh, to the introduction I told you that if you have a cold chain and only part of it is reactive well you lose benefits of reactive and so what we did right now is we migrated the front-end part, the controller port, the routing port, but we kept the data access, access port blocking. So our application looks reactive, but is not. We don't get all the benefits of reactive. In order to get all the benefits of reactive, we must actually migrate the data access port to reactive as well. And that is much involved. Let's check what we can do. So the first thing we need to do is to actually change the pump completely. And when I say completely, I say, well, a, like a lot. Um, the first thing is there is no reactive GPA. So we must let go of GPA and instead of GPA, we must use R2DBC, which is the reactive way to access databases in the Spring ecosystem. And then we can uh, remove our H2 database and replace it with R2DBC H2, which basically is the same H2, but with a reactive access, with a reactive driver. And because we let go of GPA, we let go of Hibernate, and we also <laughs> let go of the cache. And that is not great. So in the latest step, I will uh, bring back the cache, but now we don't have the cache anymore. On um, the repository side, it's just as easy as extending from a different repository, so reactive sorting repository. On the application side, uh, we just need to enable our 2DBC repositories. And uh, now our person routes look a bit different because now the repository dot find all and doesn't return a list of person, it returns a flux person, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction about flux and mono, and here we, it doesn't return a person, but a mono of person. So those have like reactive wrappers around either one or zero elements, or here like n elements, star elements. And here we've got our body back, and we just need uh, to say a hey, from publisher. And, and that's all. But we just like lost uh, our caching, which is, I believe, not that good. Um, also, something I forgot to mention, uh, we must explicitly provide the schema. Uh, previously, Hibernate created the schema for us. Uh, you can rely on Flyway, if you rely on Flyway or um, on something else, that's fine. But here, Hibernate provided the schema for us. Now it doesn't, so we must do it explicitly. And because uh, now in the latest uh, Spring Boot version, it automatically reads the schema.sql. You don't need to do that yourself. Um, before Spring Boot 2.5, I think uh, you needed to read that uh, yourself. Let's curl it and it works. But of course here, I cannot show you the cache because there is no cache. So we, we read directly from the database. Mm, okay. Um, now, I'm telling you that in this, um, in this current incarnation of the code, no call is blocking. And you can believe me, or if you are engineers, probably you, you want to ask, but how can you prove that your code is not blocking at all? And that's a very good question. And I encourage you, especially at the beginning, but even later, to uh, always check that your code is not blocking. And for that, we have something called Blockhound. So Blockhound is a little uh, library uh, with, uh, based on a Java agent that will check that actually no code is blocking in places where it shouldn't be blocking. So of course you will probably have code that is blocking, but in, if they are on the main, if they are not on the main event loop, that's not an issue. The thing is you don't want to, to block on this event loop. So here I'm, I, I've installed block handle. It's just a single line of codes. Uh, this shouldn't be done in production because then you will instrument your whole application. But in development, in testing, I mean, everywhere before production, it's really good to use Blockhound. So now we, we start the application and we will check if we do a call, uh, will it be right or not? And if Blockhound detects something, it will throw 
an, an exception. Let's check. Uh, it seems to be working. So that, that that's fine. I'm happy about that. Which is good because uh, I prepared the demo. So if it didn't work, it would be not that great. I now want to add uh, the additional capability uh, just to let you understand um, the, the change of mindset. I want to like return a dedicated HTTP 404 if the entity is not found. So, so far I have five entities in my database. Let's say, uh, let's say I want to check for 10 uh, and I, I want to return a 404. And here, this is what I tell you about, uh, I told you about when I told uh, you, you must understand the change of API. So here we cannot do an if, because if I do an if, I will be blocking. So what I do is I will call my repository dot find by ID. And again, it's a mono of person, which might contain a person or not. I cannot just get the person inside right now, because if I do it, it will be blocking and I want to subscribe to it. No, what I, I'm, I'm doing is, hey, when the subscription happen, when I will actually try to get uh, what's inside, um, if it's not containing anything, so if it's empty, I will switch to this. And in this, I provide a mono of error that contains a provider of a response status exception. How does it work? We can check now. How does it work? We can curl an non-existing entity, sorry. And has it started yet? I'm too eager. I'm too eager. Yes, so it still works. And now if I query for entity 20, it tells me, hey, 404. So no if doesn't work like that. Remember, I told you I, 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 I let go of the cache. Now is a good time to bring it back uh, into scope. And so I will uh, add what is missing in this project because it's a spring project and everybody knows that when you do spring project, you should have a caching layer, uh, a service layer. It was not a regular spring project. It had no like service layer. It's a joke. Um, I see a lot of people saying, hey, we must have a service layer. Not if you don't have any logic. Uh, you don't need to. But here I have this service layer just to provide some caching. So the person routes, the handler actually will like not get the repository. It will get the service and the service itself will get the repository. And I have to provide my own cache, which is an IMAP. And I'm using still Hazel costs here. It's just that I'm using it explicitly, whereas before it was Hibernate that used it and you were not exposed to that. And the ID is now I have my find by ID and it's a regular like cache. So I get it from the cache. If it's not found in the cache, I will get it from the repository. And if it succeeds, so if I get it from the repository, I will put it in the cache. And if it's found in the cache, I will just wrap it under a mono. And on the find all part, it's just hey, every, every time I find an item, I put it in the cache. So let's see if it works now. And if you followed along, you will notice probably that it doesn't work because I told you no if, no whatever. And here I have like if and else and everything that gets in the way. Um, so normally here at this point, Blockhound should tell you, hey, no, you did something bad. You are blocking. And actually, let's do that. So yeah, I have a 500 error, internal server error, and Blockhound successfully detects that I did something bad. And it's not even in the if or whatever, it's in the caching service at line 19. So here I'm accessing the cache in a blocking way. And I shouldn't be blocking at this point. At this point, I shouldn't be blocking at all. So I need to change my way to write uh, my codes from like what I'm used to, to how the reactive way is, and it's a bit involved. And that's the reason why I mentioned the different mental model. I will need to do the same logic, but using the uh, reactive API. So here, the first thing that we need to do is um, we need to call an async API. And uh, fortunately, um, Hazelcast has one. 
And so we provide this uh, provider that will return completion stage. And now you might know this completion stage. It's one of those old uh, like uh, types from the GVM. They are being superseded right now, but uh, we are like Hazelcast is compatible with Java 8. So we are uh, using types from Java 8. So we miss bridge from this completion stage to the like project reactor world. And there is a wrapper for that. So there is this mono from completion stage. So here, th there, there might be something or, or not. We don't know. If it contains something, then we will say, hey, like we log and we say, hey, it has been found into the cache. So here it contains something. Now, if it doesn't contain something, we will switch to another branch. And this branch, we will do this find by ID. And if we find it, because there is a chance we don't find it, if it's uh, like an entity that is not existing, we will put it in the cache asynchronously. And likewise, sorry, likewise, uh, on the uh, find all sides, every time we have an item, we put it in the cache asynchronously. And now if we start the application again with this version of the code, uh, what will happen is that everything will work, block handle will be, will be happy, and our application will be reactive from end to end. So I shouldn't be too eager now. Yep. Uh, sorry, here. Let's clear everything and let's check. So I curl entity two, it works. And let's check the log. And we see that the person with ID2 has been set in the cache. And now if we redo it again, hey, person with ID2 is found in cache, so we didn't get any database access. That's pretty nice. So there is time for some wrap up. Um, if you want to migrate from uh, imperative to reactive, I would really encourage you to migrate to functional APIs first, just because you are not used to it and just to realize that hey, hey the code is completely different if you keep annotations then there, there is a chance that you will be too familiar with the annotation model and you will like reason about the same engine whereas it's a completely different engine in your like call chain everything needs to be reactive you should have no blocking call and to be sure about that, you can ask a reactive guru, you can have reviews, or you can set block hand during development, which I encourage you to do. Reactive is more work. Uh, it's not impossible, but it's definitely more involved. It's harder to debug, harder to reason about. Uh, and the most important uh, take of this talk, if you remember one thing, is don't use reactive because others do. Don't use reactive because it's hype. Use reactive because in your context, um, it adds value to you. So the cost of using reactive will be less than the cost of not using reactive, for example, in the cloud. I thank you a lot for your time. You can uh, read my blog, you can follow me on Twitter. More importantly, if you are interested in this code repository, you can you want to do it yourself at home. Uh, everything is on GitHub. And if by any chance I got you interested in Hazelcast, you can join our Slack or get some free training. Thanks a lot again for your attention and I wish you a good rest of the conference.